Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 244, recorded at Big Dog Studios in Eugene, Oregon. This show is made possible by... Oh man, that's such a pickup. You gotta try this tiger tea from Sacred Blossom Farms. In fact, if you go to sacredblossomfarms.com right now and enter in Real Herb, all caps, 15, you can save 15% on your next order. Tell them that Practical Herbal sent you. When times are lean and when they're bountiful, one basic tenet holds true. Good health relies on good nutrition. Today we're talking with Phyllis Delight, folk herbalist, about how to make sound nutrition a part of your life. Now here are your hosts. I'm Candace Hunter. I'm Patrick Hunter. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Welcome, Phyllis. I am so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. After all of the insanity of the pandemic and all of the economic crazy and crash and everything else that's gone on over the past year, I really wanted to invite you to come talk with us a bit about good nutrition and how to get that, even if times are really, really lean. All right. Because I know you know that. <laughs> I know well, you've you. got those skills. <laughs> <laughs> That and a few herbs, and you can conquer the world. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Food is our foundation. Nutrition is our foundation. Um, if if we don't have a good nutritional foundation, our, our body systems do not have what it need what they need to operate efficiently and effectively um, and this come from our food and of course you can get it from supplements and I occasionally I do recommend nutritional supplements uh, when a person has uh, a health condition that's using up a lot of nutrients or they've been health de nutrient deficient for a while because of their eating habits are um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I'm not discounting nutritional supplements in this, but food is our foundation. This is where we should go first. And one of the things about COVID that I have found uh, really interesting during this pandemic is that physicians, um, a standard method of treatment for this is vitamin C, IV, vitamin A, IV. Um, a vitamin D, et cetera, because they're, they have come to understand that if we are deficient in primary in these nutrients, the medicines aren't going to work well um, either. There's going to be more side effects to the medicines and the inflammation is going to be higher in the body. And our immune system isn't going to operate very well. And, you know, and so there was this whole list of, and so it's very hopeful to me, to see this kind of integration happen. Yes, yes. I mean, the truth is that we evolved next to the vegetables in conjunction, feeding each other for centuries. They are right. going to be the best way to get nutrients into our bodies when that available, is, when possible. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. So I followed a lot of different people on Facebook. Um, and one of the interesting things that that I've been following because I had recognized this in my own community is that not a lot of people know how to cook anymore. Yeah. It's like this whole generation was raised up on eating out. I mean, it's not really their fault. Right. You know, parents took them out yeah. and, you know, and one of the things in my practice I got a, an awareness of is I used to ask people, do you eat at home or do you eat out? And by that question I meant, are you cooking at home? Or are you eating out? But what they took it to mean was they were driving by and picking up takeout and eating it at home. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I had to clarify that question to, do you cook? Yeah. And not a lot of people cook very much anymore. And one of the things that I have seen people post on Facebook and heard conversations about is, I've got to learn to cook. I'm learning to cook. Mm -hmm. um, somebody posted the other day, I made a pot roast. And I'm thinking, 
you throw it in the crock pot, which is what she did. Mm-hmm. How hard is that? But <laughs> there wasn't the awareness to even do that before or the time. Maybe, yes. it, maybe it wasn't even in their time. Maybe it was just everybody was so dark, darn busy. You know, yeah. everybody's working, kids running here and there. When do you have time to cook? So that's even in the best times uh, without the pandemic, this is what I tend to see. People yeah. don't have time to cook. They don't have time. They don't make time. And I mean, even if they can find time to cook, getting to the grocery store is an ordeal. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Doesn't happen. So, you know, so we've got several things to look at here. Um, One is how to schedule the time to cook because it's a scheduling issue. Yeah. It very much times. You know, in our family, that's, whoever's duty it is to cook that day we we are we are of a constitution where we eat usually a couple of meals a day rather than three because mm-hmm. you know we don't and we don't have very active physically active jobs so you know we got to pay attention to what we're doing diet wise and if it's your day to cook you know that you have to be home an hour earlier than usual mm-hmm. and, and you had to have already before that before you're driving home you have to have figured out what you're going to make to make sure that you know, you're in the right state, so you can actually get it done in an hour. That's right. And so let's back up on that scheduling. So we can talk about, let me, let me do a quick outline here. We can talk about people who have the resources, but don't have time to cook. Don't, all right. And then we can talk about people who don't know how to cook and um, they don't have the resources to eat out. So we've got two different groups here. Yeah. Yeah, and we're not even going to talk about the people who have so much money, they hire a cook right. in their own oh, category. That would be yeah. a nice category, they're, but no. It would be. <laughs> so they're on their own. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> they have to hire someone who knows what they're doing nutritionally. That's their job. That's right. They'll figure that That's out. That's their job. <laughs> so um, having the resources to buy food or to grow your food, which is another thing. Yeah that I've seen in my community, everybody has a garden this year. Yeah, yeah. Gardens are popping up a lot of raised beds in our area. Yeah, gardens and everywhere. I mean, the whole country is, I think, doing gardens this year, which is really good. It really good. It's good. Yeah, so, you know, it's about food security and growing your own food. But what about, you have the resources, you can go to the grocery store and buy whatever you need is raw ingredients. And, um, or you can pay a, a fee and have meals delivered, the raw ingredients of a meal and an outline of the meal um, delivered to your home. And you just follow the instructions and make the meal from what you're sent. Yeah. Right. And there's a certain amount of people, number of people who have found that really useful because they don't know how to schedule and they don't know how to buy. And the other thing with cooking is knowing what food to put on at what time during the sequence so everything gets done at the same time. Right. That's an art form in itself. It is. Uh, It is. But so having these prepackaged plans where you can just follow them ensures that everything comes out at the same time. Yeah. Um, And plus it's like having groceries delivered. Yeah. So I always like with my clients um, who don't have time to cook, I'm saying let's talk meal prep and let's talk crock pots. Yes. Crock pot is a beautiful invention. Let's talk Instapot. Yes. But it still is helpful to meal prep, which means that you don't wait till that morning to decide what you're going to cook that night. You've decided it a day or two ago. Yeah. So that's really how far back it is useful to schedule your main meal of the day, you know, what you're going to have and do you have any ingredients and think about how to prep for that at a time. And so one of the things you can do to prep is to get everybody together. I mean, it may just be you. So get you together or Mm -hmm. if you're living in a house with other people or family, get everybody together and everybody chops up two or three days of vegetables all together at the same time. 
Yeah. Zip Ziploc bags in the refrigerator. And then, you, and then it's prepped. You know, you just yeah. haul them out to for your recipe, whatever it might be. That saves a whole lot of time. If you're doing the crock pot stew of something, it's prepped. Everything goes in in the morning. It's ready when you get home that day. Yeah. If you're doing the Instapot, everything goes in. 20 minutes later, everybody, everything comes out. And you've taken out a big chunk of time by meal prepping, by doing this. Chop, now, don't do your onions, but you can do your squashes and, bro and you know, yeah. broccoli and cauliflower and, and um, zucchini and all these veggies, but not your onions. They need to be chopped in the moment for the best flavor. Yeah. And not chopped ahead of time. The same with your garlic. Yeah. And so then that becomes a, a big time saver right there. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. In fact, I was a few years ago, someone accused me of being a little bit food centric because I've tended to think like two or three days in advance of what I'm going to cook next. I think, Patrick, you do the same thing. Oh, well, yeah, because yeah. you have to have everything prepped or ready or, or thawed if that's what you're going to do. And yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. If it's in your freezer, you got to be able to thaw it out in time. Mm -hmm. And all this requires advanced thinking. It's not food. Yeah. What did you call it? Food centric? Yeah. Um, food centric. It's, it's, <laughs> right. No, it's just, it's just meal awareness and yeah. getting it on the table for yourself or you and your family um, in a timely manner without a lot of stress because cooking can be stressful. Oh, yeah. If you're walking in the door stressed from work and you have to start immediately cooking, then that stress is now the energy driving your meal preparation and yeah. cooking. Right? And it, it comes through in the food. It really does. I mean, it does. Yeah. So it, it comes through in how, how well the food tastes, how well it's cooked. Did you hurry it? Is it half cooked, et cetera, et cetera. You can you can just see that the person was really super stressed and, and when they were cooking instead of having this stuff ready to go and thinking, oh, take, I can take a breath. I don't have to rush. Yeah. I, I can go have a shower first or I can have a 10 minute nap first and really let go of the day. Then I'm going to get up and cook. Yeah. Right. Um, so little things like that, I think, are super helpful for people who are busy but have resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not thinking of anything else at the moment, but I may come back to that as we go along. Um, but I want to start talking about people who don't have resources. Yeah, because that's a big one. And there's a lot of people that have found themselves without the resources that never were without the resources before in their lives. Right. Yeah. So one, one of the exercises I have my students do in my herb school um, is I say to them, you are a family of four. You get $400 a month to buy groceries. Oh, ouch. <laughs> I, hey, this is like really common yeah. and like a lot of people. This is it. Yeah. What are you going to buy? Give me a week's worth of food, you know? Yeah. You know, give me, right? What, what can you buy? How are you going to stretch that money out? Yeah. And yeah. And $400 is nothing to yeah. buy food with for a month. It's nothing, you know? And some, some groups might get 600 with food stamps. That's it. Right. 4 to 600 a month for a family of four. You know, a lot of people spend two or two hundred dollars a week at groceries and don't think anything about it, or three hundred a week in groceries and don't think anything about it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's so how can you make that dollar stretch? The first thing I'm going to suggest you do is learn how to make beans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking the exact same thing when you said that. I'm like, oh. There's going to be a lot of beans and a lot of rice. A lot of beans, not so much rice. Potatoes are fine. Potatoes are actually 
more nutrition in a, in a potato than white rice. What if you're talking about brown rice though? Well, brown rice has more nutrition, but it's also a whole lot more expensive. Uh, yeah. So we're looking at dollar for nutritional value. Yeah. Potatoes right? are that good. Effect. Potatoes are good in that category. Um, so learn how to soak your beans overnight, at least six to eight hours, soak them overnight and cook them. And you can, for a dollar and 29 cents, you can get a couple of meals from a pound of beans. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. And you can cook them Decent in the crock protein. pot too. Well, if you cook them in the crock, crock pot, make sure you boil them for about 15 minutes until the skim stop, until, you know, because it's going to fall yeah. with the dry beans. All right, so soak your beans overnight, pour off that water the next morning, pour it off, and then add new fresh water, put them on to boil, because what we want to do is release the lectins, and they have to boil for that to happen. And what if you don't release lectins? What is the... Well, then you're getting lectins, which can... Lectins are anti-nutrients. Okay. Um, and they can have, they can block the uptake of some of your B vitamins. They can block the uptake of your zinc and other minerals. And they can cause deposits in your joints. Okay. And they cause inflammation in your body. They're anti-nutrients. They're also inflammatory. So that would be one of those key pieces of information that people who are just learning and trying to do this on a budget really need because mm -hmm. good nutrition is key to preventing COVID from returning. That's right. So, so um, after you add the fresh water, put your beans on, bring them to a boil, and then cut the heat down to a medium simmer and let them slightly rolling boil for about 15 minutes and the water will get foamy and, and it'll get a little skimmy. Okay. And then you take that off with a spoon, you take it off. And when it stops that skimminess, you just put all that water and beans in your crock pot, turn it on low and forget about it for eight hours. Nice. But you have to do, you have to have that boiling time first. Yeah. And then if it's always good with beans to make as much as you can at one time, because, hey, you got a big pot, cook a lot of beans, yeah. um, eat them, put some in the refrigerator for the next day and freeze the rest for another meal or two down the road. So Smart. beans freeze, cooked beans freeze really well. So yeah. now you just save time down the road somewhere. You can haul them out, right? That's smart. I encourage everybody to have a small chest freezer in their house. They're not expensive. You can pick one up for 150 bucks. Oh yeah. Oh, right. And, and I say that it's not expensive. If, if you don't have 150 bucks, that's a lot of money. It's a big bite but out of your $400, but it's a big bite out of your 400. But oftentimes you can pick up a used one that's very serviceable. For 35 or 45 or 50 bucks, but this can this is this is food storage, so yeah. you you know really good thing to have. So when you cook those beans, and you begin to cook more than one meal at a time, mm -hmm. they're not going to go in the top of your refrigerator for very long. You're going to use that space up pretty quick. Yeah. So a good chest freezer. I think chest freezers are a little more economical to run and a little more economical to buy than side by sides or some other times. Mm -hmm. And when you're making potatoes, don't freeze well, don't freeze your potatoes. No, no. the texture is totally different. Chicken and eh, it's okay, but you lose something in the texture of chicken too when you freeze it, but your meat can always be added in at the last, but your mixed vegetables, your beans, your zucchinis, your squashes, stick them in the freezer. Yeah. You know, you, you've got something to down the road. And this is what uh, homemakers, quotations around homemakers, mm -hmm. uh, were taught back in the 
50s, 60s, and early 70s. This is how you feed your family. Yeah. And I love cookbooks from that era because they're, they always talk about how to store the food too. Yeah. You don't, you don't get this in modern recipe books. No, modern recipe books either assume that you're going to cook for all eight people at once or you're going to consume all of it somehow right then and there. It was, then, it's just and, and also they assume you only have 35 minutes to make the meal. Right, right. So, yeah, so everything is quick, easy, down, and dirty. Yeah. But these recipe books from this time period was all about nutrition and food storage. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the recipe, it will say to freeze, yeah. and it will give you the instructions for it. So I love those cookbooks. And, and if you're gluten sensitive, doesn't mean you can't still use the recipes. You just modify. You yeah. just leave it out. You know, always yeah. never be afraid to modify. This is another rigidity I see in um, the world today. If it's not, the recipe isn't, if they can't follow it, they discount it. Exactly. Right? Right. So right. never be afraid to modify a recipe. Um, Never be afraid to leave out the wheat and substitute um, a gluten-free mixture mm -hmm. or, or just leave out that at all. It may not even be necessary. Um, you know, so um, never be afraid to leave out the meat if you're vegetarian or vegan mm -hmm. because the recipe is awesome otherwise, but it has meat, leave it out. Yeah. You don't have to have a special recipe. So I love these cookbooks from that time period because they'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And the other thing about cookbooks from that time period I really like is that um, this was a time period when the culture um, in the United States was not heavy meat oriented. Yes. Yeah. It was pre, you've got to have meat in every meal. That really didn't start, I don't think, if I'm thinking back correctly historically, maybe until the 90s. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, so here's your fried chicken and here's your, you know, yeah. pork chops and here's, you know, yeah. back, back in the 60s and 50s, 60s and 70s, meat was a luxury. Yeah. And... So many of those cookbooks, if they use meat in the recipe, it's a small amount. So it was the small amount added in. Yeah. It wasn't the main focus of the meal. Yeah, I've, I've liked that when I look at those. And also when I look at um, like everyday cookbooks for Indian families or Chinese cuisine or any of those, because they treat meat like a condiment. So, you know, two ounces of pork and that's it. For the whole yeah, meal. well, you know what? So did Betty Crocker yeah. back then. Yes, exactly. Or, and, yeah. and Better Homes and Gardens and and um, your Home Extension. I love Home Extension cookbooks. Um, I don't know if y'all have Home Extension there, um, but it's, a, it's an arm of the agricultural, um, state agricultural departments. Uh -huh. They teach you canning here. You don't know how to can? Contact your Home Extension. Every yeah, we, county has one. Yeah, we have that here as well. Yeah. Perfect. Make use of your home extension. The more you use them, the more money they get, the more people they can teach. Yeah. Yeah. They will teach you how to can. They will teach you how to freeze. They will teach you how to garden. They will come out and test your soil for you and make sure you have good soil to grow whatever it is you want to grow. Yeah. It, the, they're a pretty amazing group of uh, people, actually. <laughs> yeah. They are really amazing and they're really underutilized. Yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling that they're going to be seeing some more people turning to them a lot more over the next year or two. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I'm, I'm glad they managed to hold on to some funding in the meantime, um, because there, yeah. there have been times when their funding was so cut. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> people just weren't utilizing their services. Right. So you've been listening to Real Herbalism Radio for a while now. And you've been thinking, boy, I'd really like them to cover this topic or 
I'd like to hear from that guest. Guess what? There is a way you can make your desires known. Join the Herbal Nerd Society, and you will have the direct ear of Candace and Patrick, and you can ask them to include the things you're interested in. HerbalNerdSociety.com So let's talk about one of the things I know that is important to a good diet is getting variety in. Right. How do you do that on a thin budget? That's hard. That is really hard. Yeah. Um, and you'll get really tired of eating the same veggies over and over. Mm-hmm. But I say, I say to folks, look at the colors on your plate. And always try, it's not optimal, but always try to have three colors on your plate and one on the side. And on the side is where I put the fruit. Nice. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you can have three colors on your plate, potatoes are white, a, a color, mm-hmm. right? And broccoli is green, a color. Yeah. Um, summer squash is yellow. You got three colors. There you go. Are, right? And then grapes on the side and have those grapes or those strawberries or that apple. And you got four colors. And it's not absolutely optimal because they suggest five. I think the Food and Nutrition Board of the United States right now is suggesting five colors on one plate. But it, that may be harder than people can do. Right. Because, you know, zucchini is green and white. Um, cabbage is green and um, uh, right so it's hard to get different colors when you're when you're eating these more common foods and these are these common foods are the one that the ones that people can afford to buy right and so you just have to mix and match um, so you know if I think about my Walmart which is where I have to go to buy groceries or my food land there's two um, two two grocery stores close to my house and those are it. I don't I don't have a specialty grocery store anywhere close to me. Right. Like a Whole Foods, right? right? I don't have one. Yeah. So you don't have to have a spe- specialty grocery store and um, to eat healthy. And I love going over to the next big city um and walking around and looking at stuff. But guess what? Everybody has carrots in their orange. That's a color. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Every grocery store has butternut squash. That's orange. Yeah. That's a color. Right? Yeah. I, so I, I do try to eat organic from my grocery stores as much as possible, but they don't always have it. Right. I also, you know, in season, love going to my local farmer's market. Because um, they've worked hard and they make very little money. Yeah. It's hard work being a local farmer. I yeah. mean, it's hard to labor. Um, and there's not a huge profit margin there no. at all. No, there isn't. And so I'm, I'm always happy to support my local farmers and my local we call them fruit stands here, even though there's not always a lot of fruit on them, <laughs> right? Produce stands. Yeah. Do you um, guys have you community know, supported agriculture programs there too, where you get like a box of produce, you go down to the farm stand and pick it up every week? We can. Um, sometimes they'll deliver it. We do have some of those. Yep. Yep. Um, but you have to have money for those. Yeah. And I, I and I love supporting them. Our community um, is is and some communities do include like we have a community one that you can use food stamps there. So you just you call them and make arrangements, but they'll take food stamps as part of their like part of doing them. So Right. And farmers it. market that's what I like about farmers markets too. Almost all farmers will take food stamps. Yep. So yeah. um yeah, and then you know you've got something you know who grew your food you can look at the face of the person who grew your food and yeah. uh, know it and know you're helping somebody in your community yeah and i my own personal experience with that has been that buying my vegetables from the big giant grocery chain knowing that they came from somewhere very far away 
Well, as compared, you know, that, that potato compared to the potato that I actually grew, you know, that I, not that I grew, but that the farmer that I know the farmer, I went to, got it from right. the farm stand. It's more the, the food that didn't come from the giant food chain usually is more satisfying. The farmers. Oh, wait, and tastier. It yeah. just tastes better. Exactly. So if it tastes better, a lot of times you feel satisfied with less of it and therefore spent less money in the long run on the food that you just right. ate. Even though the potato itself was more ounce for ounce was more expensive than the chain grocery potato was. Well, it, there's also a good chance because it has a short, shorter transport time that it has more nutrition. Right. That they didn't have to harvest it super early and let it wrap it on the road. Right. Um, right. So the nutrition is higher. Yeah. So there's one grocery store in town who who does buy a lot of local far, produce from farmers. And so I will, that's one of the reasons I go to food land. Yeah. Uh, I can get peaches from the orchard like 10 miles away. Nice. Yeah. Without having to go to, because they, you know, the strawberries and they do try to buy local. Yeah. Um, and they're only a local chain, right? Right. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've... they can do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've, I mean, we've, it's the smaller, the small to mid sized grocery stores are usually the ones that seem to be able to do that. Because they tend to be more local or semi-local. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and one of the other things that I've thought about, which I believe, though, you know, I have no science to back me on it, but I believe it holds true that a zucchini grown in my town is probably going to be better suited to feed my body than a zucchini grown 200 miles or more away where the climate's different and the conditions are different. Well, that's Southern folk medicine, right? Yeah. That, you know, that yeah. the, the herbs you need, the foods you need are the ones right outside your door that, that are in your area. Yeah. Um, yeah, because they're getting the same water you are in the same soil mm -hmm. that you, you came out of, that your mama ate food while she was growing you inside her. She ate the food out of that soil. Yeah. So you have a direct connection to that soil and, and the food grown in it. Yeah, and they they're they're all it's the same stressors. We're all facing the same stressors. So Right. Yeah. Right. You know, they uh I I am concerned about the quality of our of our food supply chain and how our food is mass grown. That even organic food, yeah. um, I worry about that. Is it really organic? I mean, there, there are some things that they're legally allowed to spray on that are considered and still be called organic that if I was growing them in my yard, I wouldn't have found them. Right. Um, yeah. Right. So I, I do try to buy organic as much as possible, but I am also aware that that's a very broad label. Right. Yeah. If I'm given the choice between a, you know, farmer that I know or that I can talk to grew this tomato or this bushel of carrots or whatever it is I'm looking at versus an organic one from a really good grocery, but it came from far away. I'm more likely to choose the conventionally, I'm going to use quotes around that, the conventionally grown farmer that I know who was local and I know he has more of a polycultural, like he grows many crops. I'm, right. going to choose, I'm more likely to choose his stuff, even though it's not technically organic because it probably is realistically organic. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. And you know, and the bottom line is we all do the best we can with what we got. Yeah. You know, yeah. we all do the best we can with the money we have. Yeah. And I really feel like that it, the more we can educate people about their bodies and how they work and what's good for their bodies, what supports their bodies, the wiser choices that people make. Yeah, so true. And it, yeah, that just, it's so true. It, it makes me think about how one of the ways that when, when our family has seen really lean times, one of the ways that I made the, you know, we have like the same foods over and over and over the beans. And in our case, there was a year of, there were excessive number of pears that we were having and another year there were plums and it gets to the point where you just can't stand them anymore because there's too many 
And one of the right. ways that I helped extend our tolerance of them was choosing different herbs and spices, some of which I purchased, like ginger I did not grow myself, but other things like right. the spearmint that was growing in my backyard. You know, spearmint with plums right. is really different than ginger with plums, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when we have too much of something, that is a good time to store it away. Mm-hmm. Oh, save it for a rainy days. Put it in the freezer. And I, I am saying freezing rather than canning because freezing is not hard. Yeah. You know, and you don't need any special equipment other than the freezer. Yeah. You don't, you know, where when canning will actually preserve things longer. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a canner and you have to understand pressure and you have to be, understand how to work that canning device. Right. And, you know, and like I say, your home extension service can teach you how to do this or it's all over, you know, the Internet. You can you can figure it out. Yeah. But it's still a big piece of equipment that's expensive yeah. uh, in addition to anything else and takes some work. So if you can just learn, if you can just get a freezer and learn how to freeze your food uh, for storage. Now, if your electricity goes out for three days, you're going to be screwed because you're going to yeah. like lose a lot of it. Um, but that hopefully won't be happening. That's going to be the downside of freezing your food. Right. Right. Is you, you're going to need electricity, or if you're if you have gas in a freezer because they do make gas freezers, you're you're it runs on something outside. Once you can something. Um, it's going to be good for two, three, four, five years. Yeah. Five years easy. Um, you know, but learning pressures and temperatures to avoid botulism, that, that is a science. Yeah. And, you know, if you're getting started and it's the first time you're really starting to preserve stuff, freeze it. Just start there, you know. Just start there. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. You wash it. If it's a fruit, you wash it, slice it, and put it in a bag. Yep. That, that's it. Super that's, simple. that's where you start. Yep. Super simple. Blueberries. Yep. Oh, yes. And at least in our area, blueberries and blackberries are two of the big ways that we get a lot of them. They come in during, you know, when, when they're on, when it's the right season, they come in and there's loads of them. And depending on where you're going, you might be able to get them for absolutely free. And then right. you freeze them, and then you—that's you, a color that's like expensive to buy at the grocery. I mean, think about that yeah. color. Those that, those color vegetables are really expensive at the grocery. So. Really expensive, yeah. yeah. And just freeze them. Yeah. Um, and when you're freezing vegetables, depending on what the vegetable is, um, you can uh, you wash it, you slice it, you blanch it in hot water, which means you you boil it for like one to three minutes. That's it. Mm -hmm. Cool it off, put it in a bag, you're done. Yeah. Super. It's time, but it's not a huge amount of, of thinking about step one, step two, step five, step 20. Right. 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 It's, you got three, four steps. It's it. Yeah. So do that. Get comfortable with that. And then when you get to the point where you're like, yeah, I've got this freezing thing down. I'm good. You can move on to other types of pres preserving, like canning or or drying, dehydrating. Is or drying. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Drying is really good. We did a lot of drying when mm -hmm. I was growing up, especially of fruit. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, now I have a dehydrator. Back then, we put a sheet on the hood of the car and put it out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turned it over in the middle of the day. <laughs> that was our dehydrator. <laughs> it's very practical. <laughs> I mean, totally. I mean, you make do what you got. Yeah, yeah. You don't always have to have fancy stuff to make it happen. Okay, so I've got to ask you, which are the common like herbs that are really good for digestion and improving like improving your absorption so you're getting helps improve your nutritional value that are dirt cheap or free? You know. Well, I'm going to say two things because they're really dirt cheap or free. Um well, they're dirt cheap. I don't know how free they are. You can buy ginger root in any grocery store mm -hmm. or you can buy ginger tea in any grocery store. Oh, yeah. there, it's there. Let's just start with ginger. Yeah. Um, you know, and then on, on the other end, 
um, of the more soothing end, it's easy to grow chamomile and every grocery store has chamomile tea bags. Yes. So, so there are two like opposite herbs, um, opposite by um, actions. Uh, one is one is heating, and um, ginger is heating, and you know it'll help settle some nausea um, and affects the stomach acid. And chamomile is soothing; it also will help soothe high acid in the stomach, and and it's more alkaline, I would guess you would say, um, where ginger is a little more acidic. Um, in composition so we just start right there there there's two there's okay. two yeah. almost anybody can get right yep yep i've seen ginger root at the like gas station you know i mean i've seen the little itty bitty yeah. container but it's there you know and you can grow ginger as an annual just save some to put back in the ground the next year oh that's a good idea yeah yeah i mean i've totally done that just get what's in the grocery store and break off one of the little legs or throw, put it in the ground and give it some water and see if it comes up. If fine, it comes up fine. If it doesn't, you know, what, what have you lost? 12 cents. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but here where I'm at, you know, if we just kind of like put it out in the sun a bit and we don't put it in the ground too early, um, you'll, get quite a bit of ginger and we can we can grow turmeric here as an annual too so which is another good one for digestion and inflammation that is it has been cultivated so long in their their home cultures that they're used to being cultivated right right, right. so turmeric's another one that is an annual i don't it doesn't it's not going to be the perennial it is in Asia, but it can be a decent annual. That would be a good one. Yeah, I like those. What about the mint family? Oh, any mints don't grow almost anywhere. Yeah. Um, I had someone send me a, a photo today on Facebook and say, do you know what this is? I just found it growing on the edge of my woods. And I looked at it and, and she said, I think it's in the mint family. And I looked at it and I emailed her back and I, I would, or Facebooked her back and I goes, you know, that looks just like lemon balm. Yeah. yeah right? <laughs> and, and so she went, you know, it tastes like lemon balm. I said, we well, got some lemon balm. There um, you go. And she was like, she said, I have lemon balm in a pot uh, on my front porch. <laughs> she said, which is like, you know, almost a football field length away from where this lemon balm is coming up. <laughs> you know plants will do that anything yes. in the mint family you might think you have it contained but you do not but you don't no. that's right so but it is kind of cautious catnip is another good one um love catnip use a lot of that um how do you um, use also, that one how do you use catnip like is that a tea do you add it to food i use it as a tea you know i also make some um, tincture in here, but catnip is so good on digestion. You, you're burping, burping, burping. Ugh, everything feels yucky in there. A little catnip will soothe that right down. It is um, a really good herb to help release a little bile from the gallbladder mm -hmm. and to move things along without being overly bitter. I know we're we're used to thinking of bitter herbs move bile. Yeah. Um, but so do other herbs that aren't as bitter. Other herbs can be filed too. And catnip is one of those. Um, peppermint is one of those. Uh, because under that strong initial taste is bitter. I mean, they still have bitter principles. It's just not the first thing you taste. They kind of cover up the bitter with something more pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> um, spearmint. Um, but catnip also, um, excellent mosquito repellent. So it always goes in my mosquito repellent formulas too. Ooh. So topical. Yeah. 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 Interesting. And then there's still the, like the rosemary and sage, which at least in my area, those grow very easily. They'll. Yeah. yeah. And I think they grow 
uh, over most of the country, maybe uh, up in the snowier lands, they may not be as, they might not, I, I'm not sure because they are Mediterranean plants, but they grow where I'm at and rosemary just gets to be a tree. But then you can also go back and look at uh, maybe how settlers use plants for spices mm -hmm. and um, native plants. And I would have to say that I feel confident in saying that they probably learned how to do that from the indigenous people in their area. Yeah, um, I'm pretty, so, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, so cedar, it's a little bit of cedar leaf is like nice. really amazing to cook with and still rosemary. Mm, I like that. I've used Douglas fir out here where I'm at because it grows everywhere. Okay, well, I'm saying cedar, it's that, you know, cedar is not native to the United States, so it's not a cedar, right? It's right. actually a juniper. Okay. So, we say red cedar, it's really a juniper. So juniper leaves, okay. right? <laughs> Technically it would be juniper leaves, um, even though our common name is cedar. So I just want to explain that yeah. to not confuse people. These are not the yeah. cedars of Lebanon, you know? So it's, yeah. true cedars, that's where they come from. We don't have any native cedars. We have native junipers that we call cedar. Uh, yes. Um, all right, so, um, a little a few juniper leaves in a dish instead of rosemary really tasty juniper berries mm -hmm. cooking with juniper berries really tasty grinding up sumac berries and cooking with them so there are a lot of and they all have improved um, digestion and absorption at the same time and then there's, of course, black pepper. And which is not native, but we have red pepper. If you want to grow something native, that would be red pepper. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's native to really. the southeast. Yeah, I was going to say black pepper, not that's, isn't that native to like Asia or something like that? It is. Yeah. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, I love it. Uh, it it's like, and, and when I go to local meat and three veg restaurants, mm -hmm. um, the condiments on the table are, are pepper, are like pepper sauce, um, which is like hot pepper in a jar with vinegar. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, really basic. Yeah. Uh, hot vinegar is poured over the peppers. You have pepper sauce and you get on your turnip greens. Now you have a digestive aid to help digest that heavy cellulose in the in the greens um and black pepper and that that's it yeah. <laughs> that's <all. laughs> those are our spices here um but they're all nice digestive aids too yeah uh, red pepper black pepper um does it really good and black pepper is pretty darn cheap mm -hmm. um it's almost you can you can afford a little black pepper when you can grow your red pepper even if it's in a pot on your balcony. Yeah. All those spices help to make the same meal the same. be different. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And ginger. Um, we were talking about ginger, but cinnamon, yes. allspice, nutmeg, cloves. Yeah. Those are other good spices that help improve absorption, um, digestive health and absorption of the nutrients. Just, I would say to people, you, you be cautious mm -hmm. um, because how we digest spices is genetic. Mm -hmm. And if time is not something you digest easily, leave it alone. Don't force yourself to try to digest it. If those Mediterranean spices don't sit easy on your stomach, um, don't force yourself. It's just because now it's becoming an impe impediment to digestion. Right. And, you know, there really is some genetic uh, truth to that. And so uh, in my area where there is a lot of Scots, and Irish, Norwegians, they, they don't do well with Mediterranean spices at all. 
not easy to digest, um, but great with, you know, horseradish and cayenne and those sort of less oily spices. So I kind of divide spices into how, you know, oiliness. That's my crap. How oily is this? Um, thymol is pretty darn oily. And when you a say little oily, goes a long way. Okay. That, are you talking partly about the volatile oils? So how strong essentially it is? Well, that, no, because, I mean, because in thyme and rosemary, those aren't re very volatile oils, are they? They're heavy and kind of fixed. Yeah. I mean, you, you can pretty much cook the spaghetti to death and you're still going to taste the thyme. That's true. Or oregano. Yeah. So these are not volatile oils. These are okay. heavier and they're fixed. So um, these are the ones that can be harder to digest. So basil yeah. less so, because basil is one of the ones that you need to put it in right at the very end. But that's right. But like oregano and marjoram and, and even peppermint. Bay leaves and peppermint. Right. Even, yeah. yeah. So that they're less oily. They have less fixed oil. And so um, you know, play around with it. Cinnamon is a, is still slightly oily. Um, you know, if, if you look at constituent wise, if you rub it between your fingers, you can kind of feel it. But people have an easier time of digesting that cloves. Eh, not true. I mean, some people, ginger with that oiliness and ginger oils, eh, not everybody can digest it. Yeah. It doesn't work. Some, you know. So I really encourage people, if it doesn't taste good on your tongue, don't force yourself to eat it because just because you think it's going to be good for you. Right. If somebody told you you had to have turmeric because it was good for you. Right. And it's too drying for you and it bothers your digestive system and you keep doing it anyway and you end up with an ulcer, don't. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're all different. We're all totally different. We all have different genetics. We all have different life experiences. Our mamas ate different foods when they were carrying us. Uh, we may not be able to digest, may not be the herb for us, it may not be the spice for us, and we have to honor that and be aware of it. Right. I mean, that's why our we have so many different spices, so many different cuisines, because we are not all sunflowers. Some of us are roses, some of us are daisies, we're all everything, you know, we're everything. Mm-hmm. And that's it. So honor your taste and what feels good in your body. And just because the latest research or the latest like fad in the herbal community or your community, whatever it is, says you've got to do turmeric. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Yeah. You don't have to. And you don't have to do, you don't have to do any of that. If it doesn't feel good to you, don't do it. Right. That is very sage advice. <laughs> Again you're, with you're the really puns. You're really on puns today. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I didn't even notice it was a pun until after you guys said it. I'm like, oh, whoops. <laughs> Again with the puns. Well, you got to make light of it. Life is too serious as it is, especially, it is. you know, these are dark times. So you have to make as much fun and poke at things as much as you can. <laughs> Get your laughter where you can. That's right. So how can folks get a hold of you? Um, folks can go to my website, phyllisdlight.com, and find me. They can find me on Facebook, and they can find me on Instagram. Again, just my name. Lovely. And uh, those are the best ways. And they can find your book, Southern Folk Medicine, at Amazon. They can. And they and should. I say they should. They should. <laughs> well, thank you. And um, if they're interested, also do uh, online consultations. Uh, and um, I have a school. So if they're interested in learning uh, my approach to herbalism and nutrition, check me out. Yes, definitely. All right. Well, as always, put, put an herb, herb on it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. 
All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication, or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.